hand it over to Cody. Um, he is going to take us through the presentation and describe the Legio, the Legio Mix 6000 and its functions to us in depth. Uh, if you guys have any questions, please feel free to uh, raise your hand through the comment section. Uh, I will be monitoring and uh, we'll step in intermittently to, uh, to try to answer some of your questions throughout the presentation. Thanks. Perfect. Well, thanks, Pierre. And Thanks to everybody at Equipco for uh, for this platform, and uh, thanks to everybody watching for your time today. Uh, you know, it's 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 interesting that everything's gone to a, a lot of these uh, uh, virtual formats and everything like that. But I, I hope one day I can get back up there to Canada again to uh, to see some of you folks. But but like Pierre mentioned, we're going to be talking about our Legio Mix electronic mixing valve, uh, some of the features, benefits applications, do's and don'ts, uh, things like that. We're gonna be talking about Legionella uh, management. Uh, I think it's a, a good way of saying it is management because it's it's really hard to completely eradicate. But with that in mind, we're gonna talk about Legionella management. And like Pierre said, if you do have questions, my email is up on the screen there. The guys at Equipco are fantastic and they are ready to help you out as well. So, uh, so let's get into it. Before we get uh, too far, I do want to just talk about some of the educational opportunities that we make available at Kalefi. I, th I think this is one of the major things that sets us apart as a company. We, we offer so much to the industry as a whole. We want to try to lift up the entire industry with education. And, and the more you know, uh, the better off you're going to be. So uh, Pierre mentioned it earlier, Idronics is our technical journal that we provide uh, completely free of charge. You can get it as a paper copy, online as a PDF. We also have digital editions that uh, then cross-reference to other different digital resources like YouTube uh, videos and things like that. We also do Coffee with Kalefi webinars. These are a once a month webinar that we do wide range of topics. These are all archived on our YouTube channel as well. So don't forget to check them out there. And we've got a lot of other great material on YouTube as well. And uh, last but not least, don't hesitate to call, you know, whether it be the guys at Equipco or us in, uh, at Kalefi. Uh, as far as a company is concerned, we are headquartered out of Northern Italy, just outside of Milan. And so we do a lot of brass and, and steel manufacturing for hydronic and plumbing accessories. Here in the, the North American market, we are based out of Milwaukee, which is where I'm at. So we're, we're depending on where you are, we're central time zone. So just keep that in mind, but don't hesitate to call us. We've got a great team in Milwaukee uh, to help you guys uh, through any problems or questions you might have as far as applications. And uh, for those installers that are out there, I would encourage you to use this little QR code here. That QR code is on every product box. doesn't matter what product it is, but Specifically for the Legio Mix today, if you were to scan that QR code with your phone, you'd come up with a bunch of videos that would help you through the installation of the product and uh, and any other videos that pertain to that particular product as well. All right, now for the engineers that are out there, we really try hard to make sure that all of our information is easily accessible and and um, specifications, drawings, uh, anything you guys are looking for, no exception there. So whenever you are looking for uh, drawings or whatever the case may be, you can go right to our website. There's not a special website to log into. There's not a special username and password that you're going to forget or anything like that. Uh, you can go right to our website. And for example, here we've got our 548 series uh, hydraulic separator. You can see there on the right hand side, you've got access to all the spec information, instructions, so on and so forth. At the bottom, you've got drawings there. Uh, we do have 2D, 3D, uh, BIM stuff, whatever you guys are looking for, we have that available. And then we do have a full BIM library. Uh, with all of our series of products there. So you can, like I said, get the 2D, 3D, all that fun stuff. Now, if you do click on the BIM drawings, it will take you to uh, a third-party site where we host all of our BIM drawings. And, and in that case, uh, you can sign up completely for free, but, but the rest of the stuff is all accessible right through our website. But BIM, like I said, does have to be downloaded. All right. Now, uh, as far as hydronics are concerned, issues number 21 and 22 are going to be most applicable to today's presentation uh, when we talk about uh, domestic hot water and research uh, systems. So definitely check those out. Like I said, you can download them for free. You don't have to log in. You don't have to do any of that stuff. You can download them for free right from our website as a PDF. And if you do want paper copies, don't hesitate to talk to those guys at Equipco. All right. So uh, the Legio Mix. It is an electronic mixing valve, and you can kind of see here in this particular application uh, is, is, a, is a great uh, great alternative to some of your thermostatic mixing valves. 
and, and what you might already be used to. So what you've got here is actually two different legio mixes. This is a job out of New York where they were serving two different temperature zones, uh, one of which was for high temp going to a kitchen area, the other one was for low temp going out to residential areas. What you can see here in the uh, particular picture is you've got the valve here, um, we've got the actuator, we've got the sensors that all come with it, we've got the controls, we've got transformers. And, and I wanna kind of just keep in mind that all this stuff comes in one kit. It's not a, a bunch of a la carte stuff. And there is some accessories that you can buy with uh, the Legio Mix, but with that in mind, everything that you need to make it work is gonna come right in the kit. And so keep that in mind if, if you're looking at specifying this, it's a pretty easy product to, uh, to get in there, so. And before we get into applications, we're going to talk about just some of the details of, of the Legio Mix. I, I want to get these first few slides out of the way just to make sure you guys aren't sleeping or anything like that. Um, you know, and then we'll get into the more interesting stuff after a bit here. But I want to go over some of the certifications just to make sure you know uh, what we are capable of and, and, uh, and some of the certifications that we, uh, we abide by. So. Uh, again, this is an electronic uh, mixing valve, typically for commercial applications. You will find applications for this in your some of your high-end residential that might as well be commercial anyways. It is an ASSC 1017 valve, which means your point of distribution. It also is going to be low lead. It's going to be low lead BZR brass, uh, that what we're making that valve body out of. So it's going to be uh, completely all right with potable applications. Uh, I did want to add in uh, this particular note here for CSA Z317.1. We are ab abiding by that. Uh, we are tested to that standard per ICCES. So uh, for those jobs in healthcare facilities, we will, uh, we will test to that standard. So that's not a problem there at all. And you'll see why later when we talk more about Legionella, why, why that uh, uh, 317.1 is, is definitely something that we need. But uh, from there, like I said, when you order with a simple code number, you're going to get a complete system. Like I said, control, sensors, valve, actuator, everything that you're going to need. There's going to be a couple accessories that we'll talk about. One is going to be a gateway. And, and this is one of the biggest drivers, I think, towards electronic mixing valves is just information. Uh, information is, is key to a lot of these installations, but this gateway is going to allow you to get onto the building management system if you're doing BACnet IP or BACnet MSTP. We'll get over that later. Uh, but the other nice thing about this is I talk about standalone or networkable. You can connect it to building management systems or not, doesn't matter. But it also kind of serves another meaning there with standalone. Uh, there's a lot of our competitors in this market uh, specifically uh, that, that require you very specifically to have a laptop on site in order to uh, set these things up, which is a big hindrance for a lot of mechanical contractors. Uh, with our control here, it's completely standalone. You can see it right all on the screen. You can change it all through the menus. You don't have to have a laptop on site. You don't have to have it connected to billing management systems. Uh, you can do all that stuff right through the control, which is pretty straightforward and easy to use. Now, if you are in the hydronics field as well, this is also a great set point mixing valve. Um, I've even had applications where they're just using the valve body and actuator with a third party control. Uh, if they're doing like outdoor reset applications, this is a great valve with really low pressure drop, really high flow capabilities. So if you're looking for something in the hydronic applications, uh, you can do that as well. Now, the Legio Mix has been in the North American market for roughly about four years now. And, uh, and it's fairly new to the North American market, but it's not new to the world. This is something that we've been selling for two decades now all across the globe, uh, South America, Middle East, the European markets, uh, all over the place. So uh, it's something that is very, very tried and true. Uh, we did have to do a little bit of finagling to get it into the North American market, one of which being ASSC 1017. We also had to do the low lead. But the biggest hurdle with getting this into the North American market was basically North Americanizing the control, uh, voltages, uh, uh, frequencies, things like that. And, and not only that, kind of the terms that are used in the control uh, that are not very uh, common in, in the North American market as far as uh, vocabulary is concerned. So, so with that in mind, we've got it here. It's been doing really, really well for us. And, uh, and we've got a broad range of sizes. When we first started offering this, it was one through two inch sizes. We saw a pretty big demand for some of those larger applications. So we then came out with two and a half and three inch uh, sizes. And then we also saw this big, even bigger demand for smaller applications, these commercial applications that wanted electronic mixing, but they didn't need a, a one inch or inch and a quarter mixing valve. So we came out with a three quarter inch model as well. Now the three quarter inch through two inch sizes are gonna have the union connections on it, like you saw on the last page, which is gonna get you sweat, NPT or press connections. Uh, the two and a half and three inch models are gonna be the ANSI 150 flanges. So from there, this is a three-way ball valve. 
Uh, and I can't stress this enough. This is kind of the, the magic behind the Legio mix and, and what it's capable of is because with that three-way ball valve, we've got very little resistance to flow, very little pressure drop, which means we can get some absolutely phenomenal flow rates out of these things. So uh, I would be very, very careful. It is very, very easy to oversize these mixing valves if you are sizing them just based on pipe size, which um, you know, I hope everybody on this particular uh, little webinar is, is very well aware that you size based on flow, not just based on pipe size. But you know, for some of the guys, they, they go into the wholesale house, they say, I need an you know, inch and a half mixing valve. And it's, and it's just kind of a second nature thing. And I really hope that uh, in most cases we can avoid that. So, when I did talk to our colleagues in Italy, when I was training on this uh, quite a few years ago, they, they told me flat out that if they see a Legio mix installed and it hasn't been reduced down in pipe by one or two pipe sizes, that chances are it's, it's oversized. So again, keep that in mind. Now you'll notice here that even our one inch mixing valve has a design flow rate of, of 58 gallons per minute. Now our design flow rate is seven and a half PSI drop. Okay, so some designers are, are going around five PSI, some are at 10, uh, but this design flow rate is at seven and a half PSI. Our maximum flow rates are at a 20 PSI drop. And obviously you have to realize that 58 gallons a minute through a one inch pipe, I don't care what the material is, is, is probably not gonna, not gonna be kosher. So with that in mind, just make sure that you're, you're sizing this valve appropriately based on flow rates and, and your pipe sizing is correct as well. Yeah, thanks, Cody. We've we've noticed too on quite a few jobs you've done here. We've actually gone down if it's not at least a half size, almost a full size off the yep. pipe, uh, the pipe and the design drawing. Uh, so what that means as well with the competition is that with our flow rates, is we can actually by dropping sizes, we're saving costs as well. Yep. Um, so we've found that this has actually been quite crucial in situations, and they've been able in certain jobs to allow for a secondary unit as a redundancy practice as well, and that still fits in the budget. Um, so that, that's a really good, good point to be made there. And, and we see it in our designs all the time. Uh, one thing I just wanted to mention quick, sorry to cut you off here, Cody, no uh, the, the chat feature, if you did have a question, the chat feature is not, uh, not going to be, um, not going to be, uh, open for us, but if you put your questions into the Q and a box down at the bottom, we can see that. And then, uh, and then we'll address your questions through there. Perfect. Yeah. No, you make a great point. You know, um, you know, you, you look at, you know, a size, you know, if you're thinking you're comparing apples to apples, a two inch mixing valve here versus a two inch mixing valve there, uh, chances are you might be able to get away with our inch and a half or our one inch and a quarter, you know, model. And, and yeah, there could be a pretty good cost savings in there as well. And, and I've even seen it and we'll talk about it later, you know, where a lot of these places are doing parallel valves or redundant valves just uh, for, for sake of, of not interrupting service to the building too. When we'll talk about that as well. All right, so uh, from there, we, in our technical brochure, we actually make available, I, I really touched on, uh, on sizing of these valves. We, and this might look like an eye chart here and, and it's a lot of numbers here, but, uh, but we, we try to make it available to you guys to, to make sure you're able to size it very, very easily. So, so with that in mind, you know, we've got a chart here. We've got our different sizes over here on the, on the left-hand side. Say for example, our one inch, you know, has a design flow rate of 58 gallons per minute. But if you were to say, look at a seven and a half PSI drop at that 58 gallons per minute, this actually gives you your velocity in the various sizes of piping, okay? So with that in mind, if you were to put 58 gallons a minute through a one inch pipe, that would be 21 feet per second, which is absolutely screaming. And that pipe won't last very long, especially if it's copper. So from there, you start upsizing, going to uh, you know your inch and a quarter, your inch and a half, you can obviously see your velocity is going way down. now. The uniform plumbing code here in the States uh, definitely limits us to five feet per second at 140 degrees in copper. So we're actually gonna give you a nice little chart over here that tells you, you know, at a one inch pipe size, five feet per second at 140, you're capable of 14 gallons per minute and so on and so forth as you go down. So again, we try to make this available so that way sizing is really easy for you guys. And, and if you have any questions, again, don't hesitate to, to reach out. Um, now, as far as the internals are concerned, chrome plated brass ball, very highly resistant to harsh water conditions. It is going to be low lead DZR brass, like I talked about before. Uh, peroxide cured EPDM seals, again, hold up to really harsh water conditions. And, uh, and then from there, uh, we do offer another accessory, which is our inlet check valves, which are available on the three quarter inch through two inch sizes. So that way you can get check valves at the inlets of the mixing valve. Uh, now, I wanna go into some key 
features here with the Legio mix. Um, and these are features that are going to be beneficial over thermostatic as well as features that might be beneficial over other manufacturers of electronic mixing valves. Now, because we are a three-way ball valve, we have the ability to completely close off the hot or cold inlet if necessary, okay? Um, that means also that we don't have a minimum delta T difference between the hot inlet and mixed outlet like what you would on a thermostatic mixing valve. Now, what happens in a thermostatic mixing valve, a 1017 mixing valve, is again, because it cannot completely close off the hot or cold inlet, if your storage temperature drops, for example, you know, you, you want 120 coming out to the fixtures, your storage temperature drops to 120 because you had a big load. Um, if you've got a thermostatic in there, you're still going to be blending in a little bit of cold and you're not going to get that full 120 out of the tank. You're going to get 110 or 105. Um, now, in the case of the Legio mix, if it, your source drops, it will completely close off the cold if it needs to, which is, which is pretty neat, okay? The other big thing here is, is if you are running constant recirculation, which I'm always going to recommend, uh, in a constant recirculation application with the Legio mix, there's no need to basically throttle or limit the re, uh, recirc return going through the tank. Uh, again, the fact that your thermostatic mixing valves can't completely close off one side or the other. Uh, if you say, for example, are running the recirc with little to no demand off the loop, uh, you are bringing back 110 degrees, you've got 140 in your tank. And if that thermostatic mixing valve can't completely close off the hot or, or close it off enough, you could have the ability to add more heat to the loop than what the loop is giving off. And that is a huge problem. I refer to that as recirc creep. And the great thing about the lead gym mix is that it can completely close off the hot inlet if needed, which will get rid of research creep altogether. And we've got a great webinar that uh, Coffee with Collecti that we did about six or seven years ago now with Julius Polanco. Uh, it was a fantastic webinar. It's one of our most popular by a long shot. Uh, so definitely check that out if, uh, if you get a chance. The other really cool thing is between the valve and the control, we do have the ability to do a, a self-cleaning feature. It's called anti-clog. And what it's going to do is once a day, it is going to do a full rotation of the ball in both directions. And it's on by default. You can turn it off if you need to, but it's gonna do a full rotation of the ball in both directions at three o'clock in the morning. The idea here is, is if the valve is working in a tight operating range and starts to scale, the idea of moving that ball and going to sweep in both directions is going to basically use the seals in the valve to clean off that ball so that way it doesn't seize, which is a pretty cool feature as well. Um, now, we did have a question from Steve. Thanks for typing that one in. Uh, he asked, are you talking copper tube sizes, not IPS sizes? Yes, we are talking copper tube sizes. So like your, your, copper, uh, your copper, copper tube size, uh, not IPS. You're correct in that one. Thanks for the question there, Steve. Yeah, that was a good question. Thanks, Steve. All right. So uh, from there, though, when we got into uh, uh, when we got into the market, I was really concerned when we first got in that we were going to be waiting on specifications. We we're going to be waiting on jobs and, and sitting around with our thumbs uh, and our noses. But the, the cool thing with the Legio mix is that we saw an instant uh, requirement for these valves or an instant need for these valves in retrofit applications. And, and what was really cool here is uh, we, we just had a lot of contractors and and building operators and owners that were just tired of replacing, rebuilding thermostatic mixing valves. And this is a really cool application here. This was a, a hotel in Ohio uh, that had what this guy here is on the left-hand side is a four-inch Holby mixing valve. And this four-inch Holby mixing valve was at a 20 PSI drop, which is way too much, but it was capable of about 400 gallons a minute at a 20 PSI drop. Now this four inch Holby mixing valve is quite the relic and, and it's been in the building for, I wanna say three decades or more. They, they take down the hot water in this building twice a year to maintain and gut this valve. And, and it, I don't care when you do it, it's gonna be a, a problem, you know, as far as taking down hot water to the building, you know, somebody's gonna be taking a shower in the middle of the night. And so they, at the time, they were curious about going to a more robust mixing valve that's going to be capable of handling harsh water conditions a little bit better than their, their thermostatic that they're rebuilding all the time. And at the time, we did not have a two and a half or three inch valve. And, uh, and so with that in mind, I said, well, you know, why don't we sell them on this redundancy feature? Uh, the fact that they don't have to take down the entire building that they do need to maintain one of the mixing valves. And in that case, we use two two inch mixing valves. Now, I will say right here and now that uh, I, 
I asked them, I said, did you get an engineer involved to do talk about the fixture rates or the fixture units and, and how much flow you actually need? Because this building had been remodeled several times in the last three decades and chances are it really didn't need the flow that this, uh, this Holby was capable of. And, and of course they didn't. Uh, so it was really all we could do is to give them basically the similar capabilities of what that Holby was, was capable of. And, uh, and they threw in two of those uh, parallel uh, Legio mixes. Now, what I'll say here is the reason why I brought that up is because if they were really running, you know, several hundred gallons a minute through these mixing valves, uh, we would know it because they bullheaded this T right down here and, uh, and it's all on two inch. So if there's going to be an issue, chances are that that T right there is going to be the biggest problem right off the bat. And, and I haven't heard a peep out of this job since. So chances are they're not running anywhere near the flow rates that, that they needed uh, before. And I would even probably venture a guess that they could probably run this whole building off of one of those Legio mixes and, uh, and leave the other one just sitting idle and then maybe do a swap once a month or whatever, just to put equal hours on them or whatever. But, but with that in mind, um, you know, it was a really cool application. Again, uh, really harsh water conditions. They were tired of fixing it up. They put in two Legio mixes. And now they got parallel capabilities and a little bit of redundancy as well. Now, this was another application. This was a, a hospital in, uh, in Michigan. Same idea. This is where they were uh, dealing with harsh water conditions. They were rebuilding thermostatic mixing valve very regularly. And uh, in this particular application, they put in the Legio mix and, and it was doing really well for them. Now, the reason why the contractor called me in this particular case is he was having problems with what he thought was the mixing valve. And what it really was in reality in this retrofit application is one of these check valves, a swing check, I can't remember which one, uh, was, was stuck closed. And in that particular instance with that check valve stuck closed, uh, the mixing valve was doing some pretty erratic things. And so we, we talked through that, we got uh, the check valve cleaned all out and everything's hunky dory. But what I really love about this picture is this line or this uh, pipe coming through here with the, uh, the arrows on it comes back. This is a great example of how you would prevent research creep in thermostatic mixing valve applications. Okay, now, like I said, with thermostatic mixing valves, you don't have the ability to completely close off the hot or cold inlet. So if, if you're letting too much hot in, then what the loop, compared to what the loop is giving off, you could run into creep where the, the temperature is going to rise up. And what you do in those applications is you basically have to override the thermostatic mixing valve. And in this particular instance, which, how you do that is by using balancing valves on the research. So the research comes back and, and it splits in two. One goes here to the cold inlet of the mixing valve, and usually this balancing valve is left wide open. And then where it splits off down here goes back to the tank. Typically, you're going to have a mid tank tapping on your commercial size tanks, and you're going to have a balancing valve here. Now, this is where the trial and error kind of comes into play. This balancing valve is going to be throttled way down to basically where it's just putting enough heat back into the system. Then compared to what it's giving off, you know, through the heat loss of the distribution network. Okay, so you're, this is a really, like I said, very much a trial and error thing. You've got to um, get a, a condition where you've got little to no demand from the fixtures. You've got, you know, kind of a stable operating uh, condition, uh, again, with no demand. And then you're going to set that to where basically it's just adding on just enough heat to make up for what it's giving off. But now that they put that Legio mix in there, they can crack open both of those balancing valves and, and the Legio mix can handle it from there. They don't have to worry about that. But what I also thought was funny about this picture is that they do have a balancing valve uh, right here on the cold inlet. I asked the guy what it was for and he had no idea. It's been there the entire time and been wide open. Uh, so it's potentially just a really expensive shut off <laughs> right there at the cold inlet. But, uh, but with that in mind, I thought that was pretty entertaining there. All right, so uh, another thing we do to try and make things easier for everybody is we include a piping diagram that is literally zip tied to every single valve body that leaves our, uh, our premises here in Milwaukee. And um, we've got two different piping diagrams here, one for kind of your smaller systems that don't have a research tapping on the tank. We've got a, a, a diagram here for some of your larger systems where you've got the tank tapping at the midpoint there. Um, now, again, you'll notice here that when the research comes back, it's gonna split. It's going to go to the tank. It's going to go to the cold inlet. You'll have a check valve here to prevent it from going backwards. And uh, with that in mind, there's no balancing valves or globe valves on here to throttle anything because, again, the Legio mix can handle that from there. So, so no more research creep, uh, no more issues with that stuff, which is pretty awesome. All right. Now, the next thing that we did to really try to make things easier on everybody, and I hope you guys can appreciate this, 
Uh, I know a lot of the engineers love these pre-racked assemblies. It doesn't matter if it's pumping assemblies or mixing valve assemblies is that we, we brought our Legio mix station to market a couple of years ago. And uh, it's fantastic in the fact that it's completely pre-piped. It's got check valves in all the right places. These are check valves right here um, on the, uh, the research where it comes back and the, the hot and cold inlets. Now these are serviceable check valves as well with unions on them. So you can pop those check valves out of there if you've got any debris from startup or anything like that, that, uh, that got caught up in there or anything like that. We've got isolation valves again in all the right places at all the, uh, the connections here. We've also got uh, three quarter inch garden hose thread taps off the research so you can purge your research line. We've got a, a three quarter inch garden hose thread tap off of the mixed outlet so you can do your testing without going to find a fixture. It, it's really awesome here. Now, bar none though, my favorite part about this pre-racked assembly is the fact that everything is pre-wired, okay? Uh, Plumbers like to play with pipe and put pipe together. Electricians like to put wiring together, but nobody likes to deal with, with control wiring. And, uh, and coming from the field, I know that better than anybody. Uh, I love doing control wiring. It, it gave me a little niche uh, when I was still in the field that I, that I really enjoyed. But what's great about this guy here is that all of the sensors, the actuator and everything is pre-wired, which really leaves no reason for anybody to get inside the control. What you don't see in this picture, uh, they cut it out for vanity's sake. Uh, uh, is a 20 foot cord with a plug-in transformer. So when they, they're just gonna hang this thing on the wall, make their five piping connections, and then they just gotta find an outlet to plug it in, uh, which is pretty fantastic. And then once they get it plugged in, they're gonna have three questions that are gonna be asked, uh, date, time, and location. And after it does that, it is going to be a mixing valve at 113 degrees, which is roughly 45 Celsius. Um, and, and it's gonna be off and running. A lot of the other features that we'll talk about later are off by default. Um, so you'd really have to go out of your way to turn some of that stuff on. But with that in mind, really easy mixing valve to, to hang, to pipe, to, uh, to get started up and, and get off and running. Hey Cody, quick question. When you guys ship this out from your warehouse, how does it, uh, how does it arrive to site? Does it in like a couple of easy pieces that they assemble or does it actually show up like this? It's fully assembled, just like how you see it here. And basically okay. what amounts to an armored crate. Uh, it's, it's right. the, we, we had custom crates built for these guys. Uh, so when they, they, uh, when they get assembled here in Milwaukee, uh, they get loaded up into a crate. And, and again, they show up, we have knock on wood. Uh, we've never had one show up damaged yet, whether no matter where it's going, uh, anywhere in the continental United States or Canada or even Alaska. So, Excellent. so it literally is plug and play. Yep. It's, without, without you or I going out there to pipe it for them, it's about as easy as it gets. So, uh, which is pretty cool. Now, not to get too far off the rails here, but would you guys customize any of this for a specific job site? If we had certain requirements, maybe that, uh, that would throw a deviation into this, or is it fairly standard? It's fairly standard. Um, now we have had questions, you know, uh, I, I like to use the term uh, that we were walking before we run kind of thing here, but we have had a lot of questions in particular about putting research pumps on here, uh, which is right. something that we are diving into or considering here for some revisions uh, in, the, in the next couple of years. But, uh, but with that in mind, as far as dimensional, we, we really tried to make it as compact as we could. Um, now, we have had customers that will take it and turn it on on its side, you know, to make it work for their application. Uh, but as far as moving things around, I mean, you could let us know, but chances are it's it's going to be pretty standard. Um, I, I don't think we've really had any applications where it was where it was going to be more beneficial to rework this versus just using a Legio mix un unracked. Right, that makes sense. So, but that's a great question. So, so with that in mind, like I said, we try to make it as co uh, compact as possible. Um, the, the Unistrut is all welded together. It's all clamped up there. It's beautiful. And like I said, you just hang it up on the wall, pipe it up, plug it in, and, and you're off and running. And so various sizes there, one through two and a half inch. Now, what I will tell you is, is that, uh, again, like I talked about before with sizing, if we've got inch and a half pipe, we're not using an inch and a half mixing valve, okay? We're using a smaller mixing valve. And what I will tell you though, too, is that uh, you are going to be limited more so by the copper connected to the mixing valve in these assemblies than you will be by the mixing valve itself. So uh, just remember that, you know, if you're sizing it based on, you know, 
whatever particular flow rate uh, that uh, the mixing valve will handle it no problem. Uh, it's the copper that you need to be more worried about as far as sizing and making sure your velocities stay a little lower. But it is all type uh, type L copper and it's, uh, and it's about as robust as it's gonna get without going to stainless, I should say. So from there, what uh, the next thing that we offer, and I mentioned it as an accessory, is back net. Okay, uh, from right from the control, we do have the ability to go to Modbus, which is not a terribly common building automation system uh, language. Uh, but through that Modbus, we can do the gateway. It's circled down here in red. Um, this gives us the ability to go to BACnet IP or BACnet MSTP. Uh, from there, you can go into your user interface and, and do whatever whatever you want as far as what your what your uh, end user, your building engineer is going to see. So, with that in mind, the gateway, it, like I said, you can connect this up to your building management system. What's really cool about this gateway is that if you do have multiple uh, lead geo mixes on site, you can connect upwards. I believe it's about ten lead geo mixes to each backnet gateway, uh, so you don't have to buy one for every single lead geo mix. You can just um, daisy chain them together. Now you do have to change some of the, the bus ID information on there, but it's a pretty straightforward job uh, that uh, that's pretty easily done. So. With that in mind, you know what you do with that information. I think is is uh, is up to you. But I will tell you that there's been a couple of jobs where I thought it's been really really interesting because again, in the in today's day of information, um, that information is so powerful, and what you do with it and how you use it is is very beneficial. And and in one particular case, uh, we had a job where a Legio mix was installed in a hotel just about an hour and a half from our offices here in Milwaukee. And, uh, and in that particular application, they had the system up and running for some time. And what they noticed was every day for about an hour to two hours, they had a huge drop in their research return temperatures because there is a sensor on the Legio mix for the research return. They had a huge drop in their research return temperatures. And what they were able to diagnose from that data was the fact that they had a cross connection uh, in their kitchen area that was causing the research to just drop like a rock. And as far as uh, as far as its temperature is concerned, and so they were able to remedy that and and take care of it. And they probably wouldn't have known it otherwise, which is pretty interesting and pretty entertaining. Now, another one that I thought was pretty cool uh, was this job up here. Uh, in uh, North America's better half, uh, the, the northern half, uh, this job here in BC, which is uh, a job that Toby did, and I, I emailed him this morning trying to get uh, trying to get permission to use these photos, but he was uh, a little preoccupied with a family matter. But uh, but with that in mind, this was a really cool installation where they had these in a healthcare facility. This was new construction. Uh, healthcare facility where they were uh, managing these temperatures and they were making sure through that building management system that they were achieving the correct temperatures at all times. And, and again, for those healthcare facilities where, where maybe they don't have the reaction times as they used to and they, they don't have the ability to uh, protect themselves from, from high temperature and scalding and things like that, it's really, really important that, uh, that these, uh, these mixing valves work 100%. And Toby did a fantastic job with this particular installation uh, of two Legio mixes there too. I don't know if you have anything to add on this one, Pierre? Yeah, so unfortunately, uh, Toby couldn't make it with us today. Uh, we were gonna get him to speak a little bit on it. Um, so Toby's uh, been a big proprietor of the Legio mix here in our area and has helped us uh, gain momentum in a lot of different jobs. What they specialize in is what I think is really important is um, medical care facilities. Um, because we have the proper designations to get into these jobs and we have the reliability of the BACnet uh, database to ensure that we can schedule our disinfection times at uh, appropriate times. It can, and this can be scheduled or done manually. In this particular application, the, uh, the facility um, is a short-term uh, care facility uh, for people who actually don't have the ability to, um, you know, to maybe identify if they're being burnt by hot water or when to not use the water. So in a situation where maybe cognitively they're not all there. So this was very important that we had a system that not only could we control uh, digitally, but also manually in doing our, in doing our disinfections. And, uh, and it has worked uh, extremely well. Uh, it's gone above and beyond. He's got two here. Uh, one's basically essentially for redundancy. Um, the one valve pretty much handles the entire building. Now, this is a, a, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe it's a, a 12 story building um, with lots of, lots of, uh, you know, um, 
deep tubs, cold tubs, uh, different types of washing facilities uh, to take care of these people. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to touch on on the aspects of why we put this into this situation. And I've heard you talk before in your presentations, and I'm sorry if I'm stealing some of your, your slides here ahead of time, but another application you guys have mentioned was a uh, correctional facilities. And yes. I thought that was, that was another really interesting topic you guys have spoke on. Yep. Um, so, so are you going to talk about it later? Because I don't want yeah, to. Yeah, I will. It. Yeah, I will. Well, yeah. You know what? I'll leave it. I'll leave it. Because that's a really good topic. I don't want to jump ahead. But, no, no, but no, in this, right. I don't okay, have well, much thunder, but you can steal it. So that's no. Okay, well, I'm gonna I'm gonna take it because I don't have much, and you got a lot more to go with it. So <laughs> I'll steal it from you. But, right, but a lot it. like this situation where we needed we needed to make sure that we were controlling the disinfection, that it was happening, that we could schedule it, and that we could actually prove it afterwards as well. Uh, through a BACnet system and, and, and a database. So one of the interesting things that you had brought up was inmates were, um, were bringing up lawsuits against the, the care, uh, against the correctional facilities claiming that they had been burnt. They'd been burnt by hot water during a disinfection period. Um, with this device, we can actually not only schedule the disinfection period, but then we can prove that it happened during those times, what our temperatures were, and whether any of the fixtures have actually been opened or closed because the pressures would have changed. So then when these, when these claims would come about, they could actually say, no, sorry, your timing is off from when our, our disinfection actually occurred. Is, is that, is that right, Cody? Am I right? Yeah. So, yeah. so the, and I, you know, that, that was something we were going to bring up here too, but the control has the ability to do data logging, which I think is really fantastic. The data logging capability, it takes average temperatures for every hour. It also will, if you are doing thermal disinfection, which we'll get to as well, um, it, it logs all the information regarding that thermal disinfection, uh, how long it took, the temperatures it got to, whether it failed or succeeded the thermal disinfection, uh, the timing and everything else in between. And, uh, and you know, you're, you're right with, with uh, uh, the prison facilities that we've gotten these into. It's, it's been absolutely the craziest thing. So, um, you know, as, as you Canadians are aware, uh, in America, we like to sue people for everything, uh, which, uh, which is an entertainment source in and of itself. Um, but, uh, but with that in mind, the, the prison inmates would literally be suing the prison because they got scalded and, and they're using this data logging function built into the control and the data logging capabilities that you could then potentially have through connecting it to a building management system to combat that, you know, and, and uh, you know, like I said, you have the ability to log it within the control. You can go into greater depth by, uh, by taking it into a, a building management system, getting uh, trends on the domestic hot water and things like that on what's happening and, and seeing exact times and date stamps for every temperature and every time that it happened. And they, these prison facilities are using that to combat lawsuits, which is, again, uh, mind-blowing, in my opinion, that a prisoner could <laughs> be suing for that but yeah. but you know whatever works you know kind of thing so so with that in mind it's it's you know uh the reason why i brought up this particular installation and i wish i could have gotten pictures of it is that toby had some really cool graphics that showed exactly what's going on within this system the boiler operation uh, the you know the plate heat exchanger temperatures the all the different actions and, and reactions of the controls here and and again the data that you have from this from this particular product going to a building management system, it's it's only as good as how you use it. You know, if, if you're not going to use it appropriately, it's it's just kind of wasted. And in and again in today's day and age, uh, where everybody's trying to cover their rear ends uh, again from getting lawsuits and things like that, uh, data logging and and building management systems are going to become more and more popular. And obviously, you know, uh, everything's got to be smart with Wi-Fi and all that other fun stuff. Uh, so it's just a matter of time before mixing valves got there too. So right. We have a couple of questions here, Cody. I don't know if we want to address them now. Uh, we've got another one from Steve. Uh, what can we as contractors expect to happen in relation to domestic water downstream of COVID? Um, I saw that one too there, Pierre. And, and I think, I don't think that COVID is necessarily the biggest issue. I think one of the bigger, bigger issues that we're dealing with, with COVID because of COVID as a, as a, um, as a result of COVID is that we've got a lot of these big commercial buildings that are sitting dormant uh, that nobody is in right now. And, and these buildings were designed for occupancy and, and a lot of use and things like that. And, and the issue here is, is that uh, as we'll get into in the next few slides with Legionella, 
is that Legionella is looking for warm, stagnant water. Okay, and 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 it was bad before COVID. Okay, a lot of these distribution systems are wildly oversized based on data from decades ago, as far as sizing is concerned, as far as pipe sizing and, and valve sizing. Uh, but then you throw in COVID into the mix, and all of a sudden you've got these buildings that are just completely unoccupied or very little occupancy. You've got a lot of stagnant water. And so when you talk about that, that stagnant water, the ability to control and manage Legionella growth is, is becoming more and more important. And, and it's something that I think we're going to probably be dealing with more and more as, as hopefully things return back to the, what they used to be. Uh, I don't want to say normal. That's like a four letter word anymore. But, uh, uh, but when they return back to what they used to be and these buildings are becoming more occupied, uh, doing purges on these buildings, doing flushes on these buildings are going to be important. And, you know, uh, taking care of Legionella is also going to be important. Now, the other uh, question that got asked was, have you applied these on discharge of instantaneous steam to domestic hot water heat exchangers? And I believe, is this application here, is this one steam or is this off of boilers? I can't remember. I uh, know this is off of boilers. Yeah, it's this isn't water. a steam unit. Um, yeah, that's a good question, actually. I don't, I don't think I've come across that application yet. And I don't think I have either. And, and that's a, a great question. I don't see why it would be an issue. Um, you know, steam to hot water uh, heat exchangers are very common, uh, especially in like some of your uh, district heating type applications uh, with a, a central steam plant and things like that. Um, again, I don't see any real issues, uh, but, uh, but that's a great question as well. I, again, I don't think it would be a problem, but, uh, but it'd be interesting to see one for sure. Yeah, I, I can't see who sent that question, but uh, if you, have, whoever did, if you have an application maybe that you're thinking of specifically, uh, you know, we'd be curious to look at it um, and, and try to dissect that one, see if even if there was an, an opportunity for us uh, at this time. Sure. If, you, if you have anything, feel free to reach out to us. Perfect. Now, uh, we'll keep things moving here. You probably caught on to the Legio mix, Legionella conversation here. Uh, Legionella, as far as a bacteria is concerned, it's, it's again, like I mentioned before, looking for warm stagnant water. So it's going to occur naturally everywhere. Um, and where you're going to find most of your cases of Legionnaires outbreaks and things like that are typically going to be be cooling towers, okay? Um, but it can also be found in pullable water piping systems as well, especially where you're going to have a lot of debris, scale, things like that, these biofilms that are in the portable water systems. Um, and, and where Legionella becomes the biggest issue is, is when it gets into your lungs, when you breathe it into your lungs as a vapor. And that's why cooling towers are like one of the biggest culprits for Legionnaires outbreaks is because they produce this mist that you end up breathing in. But, but you look at anything from say like uh, water fountains uh, you know, uh, water features, fixtures, things like that, uh, showers, you know, anywhere where you could have those water droplets, even uh, an aerated uh, faucet, for example, you could be breathing in that mist and, uh, and do that. I was even in Las Vegas and they had those misters out over the canopies at the restaurants to help cool people down. And, and I mean, it's, it's, it could be everywhere and it is everywhere. And so, uh, so we're going to talk about that here real quick. And again, uh, inhaling it into the lungs, um, now, when you talk about Legionella, I said warm, stagnant water, you take it into your lungs. Now, all of a sudden, it's got this warm, moist environment uh, to where it can pl proliferate or multiply, and it can cause that Legionnaire's disease. Now, uh, Legionnaire's disease uh, it could also be uh, a lesser form of Legionnaire's disease like Pontiac fever. Uh, but again, uh, all these places, you look at the, you know, the fruit and vegetable misters at the supermarket, you know, the misters to keep you cool at the parks and things like that. I mean, it, anywhere can be an issue. Now, in the, in the states here, we're seeing a huge rise in, um, in Legionnaires outbreaks or Legionnaires disease cases. And, and I think one of the biggest reasons behind that is because we are testing for it more and more now. Because because of the fact that it, it does kind of uh, present itself very similarly to pneumonia, uh, that's usually what it gets attributed to, but it, in a lot of cases, it's not. So we are testing more and more for it. We're seeing huge increases in cases. Uh, in the last decade as well. I mentioned it before too, the fact that our distribution systems for domestic or potable water systems are again, wildly oversized and, uh, and they, they run into a lot of stagnant water issues, I think is another, another potential uh, reason for an increase here as well. <clears throat> now, again, how it affects our industry. So anytime you have a large distribution system, uh, it could be a, a dorm room, it could be 
a healthcare facility, a hotel, hospital, whatever, um, you know, it, it's it's going to be an issue, and and it's something that we're going to have to address. And and we talked about it before. Uh, some of the certifications that were tested to for for hospital applications or healthcare facilities in the Canadian markets. Um, it's hospitals and healthcare facilities that are going to be most prone to issues with Legionnaires outbreaks. And the reason being is that you already have people in there with compromised immune systems. And that's where that Legionnaires disease is really going to latch and take hold is again, those people that already have compromised immune systems and it's going to cause a lot of issues there. So, um, you know, there, there are a lot of things being done about it. Uh, you can't swing, uh, swing, a, swing a bat around without hitting an article about Legionnaires these days. Uh, there's ASHRAE standards being developed for it, uh, as well as uh, OSHA has, has uh, written some papers about it as well uh, as the WHO and the ASSE. Uh, again, pretty much every manufacturer of domestic hot water heating equipment um, has written a white paper about it as well. It's, uh, it's, it's coming and it's just a matter of time. Uh, you know, you even look at ASHRAE 188 currently, it is in code enforceable language. Uh, so it's just a matter of time before this hits everybody's desks and we have to, uh, have to deal with it. But one thing that I thought was really interesting here is, uh, is the issue of energy conservation versus uh, human safety uh, or occupant safety. Okay, so uh, in, in the United States, and it's probably pretty similar in some of your markets up there, um, there is codes requiring you to either run the uh, domestic hot water research circulator uh, on an aquastat or a timer or something to where basically it's not running continuously. Um, the idea here is, is to save on energy totally makes sense. But like I said, the idea with Legionella is that it's looking for warm, stagnant water. So every time you shut off that circulator, again, you're, you're producing that breeding ground there. Now, OSHA in the States here has actually come out and basically condemned the use of aquastats and timers and saying that these research pumps should be run continuously and should be excluded from energy conservation measures. And, and I think it's just a matter of time before code follows up with this, uh, because again, uh, occupant building occupant safety is, is going to, uh, Trump uh, energy savings any day of the week, and it's just a matter of time. Okay, now as far as some solutions that are out there, we've got some uh, systemic type solutions. There's also some focal type uh, solutions. They, they even make, uh, for example, um, little filters like Brita water, fil water filters that can uh, hook onto your tap at your fixture um, and that you can use. But like when you look at some of your more systemic type uh, options here, uh, they typically are going to involve chemicals, uh, UV or ozone type bulbs. Um, copper silver ionization is another, uh, another big one. Um, the one thing I want to mention with this is, is that you're usually talking about quite a bit of real estate for these particular systems in your mechanical rooms. You're also talking about a large upfront cost and you're also talking about a cost throughout the life of the system. Okay, um, these, these systems are gonna require maintenance. They're gonna require new bulbs, cleaning casings, more chemicals, uh, whatever the case may be. And so, you know, when you talk about that, th there's a cost to these systems, again, for the life of the building, uh, which you're never gonna get away from. Now, some people say, well, we run our storage temperatures up um, and, and that can help take care of Legionella. And that's true because as you do increase the temperature in, in your domestic hot water systems, you actually do have the ability to kill off Legionella bacteria. But if you're only increasing your domestic hot water storage temperature, that is pretty much leaving out the entire distribution system, which is a big problem. So, so as far as some other solutions to the problem, okay, again, you've got all these particular instances here where you can add a lot of equipment, a lot of hardware that's going to require a lot of maintenance and the, keep the uh, preventative maintenance guys uh, really busy for the rest of their lives at this building. But, but what you actually have the ability to do with our Legion, uh, Legio mix, as well as your domestic hot water source is uh, what's called thermal disinfection. Now, uh, you'll notice here on the right hand side that you've got uh, that growth range uh, between 70 and 120 degrees Fahrenheit. And, and that's where Legionella not only is going to thrive or but survive, but it's going to thrive. It's going to multiply. It's going to do its thing. But you'll notice that as you start to climb up uh, in temperature, you actually have the ability to kill off Legionella bacteria. And this is something that they've already been doing in the European markets 
for a long time. Like I said, this valve has been out for two decades. This is something that they've been doing for a long time. And this is the standard over there where they're using thermal disinfection. So what they're doing in these particular applications is they're using the electronic mixing valve, uh, for example, ours, where it has a scheduling function where you can schedule the thermal disinfection uh, for when there's little to no demand. Uh, you can raise the temperature of the storage tank, and then you can raise the temperature of the distribution as well. And depending on what temperature you raise it up to is going to determine how long you need to run that higher temperature. So if you run that distribution temperature up to 160 degrees, for example, you really should only have to run it for about 15 to 30 minutes uh, and then bring it back down to normal again. Uh, if you run it at 140, maybe you're going to run it for 45 minutes, uh, 60 minutes tops kind of thing. But there are some, some interesting conundrums here as well. Obviously, running 160 degree water down the distribution system is going to cause uh, for a lot of concern. So you do need to, in those particular applications, if you are doing thermal disinfection, you need to have anti-scald fixtures or point of use mixing valves uh, for your labs and things like that, because uh, you need to protect those occupants. Like I said, now, the next thing you, that you need to do, and this is something that we're already doing, is that you need to circulate as much of the domestic hot water distribution as possible. Possible, which means you want to reduce dead legs as much as possible. But in the end, you're going to get a lower upfront cost. Uh, you're going to get lower costs throughout the life of the building. And uh, you're looking at uh, an application that's going to be safer because you're not built, basically bringing in any more chemicals into the building. Now, I want to talk about chemicals, putting in chemicals into a building. I thought it was really interesting. Uh, the Safe Drinking Water Act here in the States actually uh, does have a a note in there that if you are adding chemicals into a building with uh, either a certain amount of fixtures or a certain amount of occupants, I, I believe it was 25 occupants, if you are adding chemicals into that particular building or into that application, you are basically now uh, liable for any issues that come about because of your addition of chemicals. So um, you got to think about the liability to those building owners. Uh, there's no liability above and beyond, again, high temperature. Uh, and, and again, that can be solved with anti-scald fixtures or point of use mixing valves with thermal disinfection. Whereas with chemicals, if, if it's not running right, it hasn't been maintained properly, uh, whatever the case may be, that could be a, a, huge, a huge safety concern there as well. Now, when we talk about the control, uh, a lot of different features here. I'm not going to run through all this, but what I really wanted to come out with with this guy is with this control is that you have the ability to, to do everything right from the front of the control here, which is really straightforward. You've got your menu button, your OK button, your two up and downs. The shock button here is a kind of a manual thermal disinfection mode. That shock button is actually disabled by default with a little dip switch on the back. Uh, so you don't have to worry about accidentally uh, turning it on by, by accident. But the other thing too is within the control, you do have the ability to do 40 days worth of data logging. And it is a, a first in, first out type of data logging. And, and again, it, it does average temperatures every hour. If you are doing thermal disinfection, it does have the ability to log everything regarding the thermal disinfection uh, as far as times, temperatures, uh, successes or failures, so on and so forth. And, uh, and you can do that really easily. Now, on the back side of the control, uh, this is kind of how the magic all happens. You're probably thinking to yourself, how do I you take this control here and make it work with the mechanicals to raise temperatures and do all this other crazy stuff? And, and this is how we would do that. Now, on the back here, we do have our communications for Modbus to take us to our gateway or to our Modbus uh, building automation system. We do have our sensors here for our uh, supply and return uh, going out and back to the mixing valve. And then from there, we've got uh, where we connect up our actuator and things like that as well. Now, over here, we've got four dry contact relays. These dry contact relays are little pilot relays. They're, they're not going to cover a lot of amperage, but you can use them to get the job done as far as thermal disinfection is concerned. Now, relay one, uh, again, pilot relay, so don't run the circulator right off of it. But relay one, if you are running an aquastat or a timer, you can use relay one in parallel with your aquastat or timer to make sure that your, your circulator turns on during thermal disinfection. Relay 2, if, if you're not using building automation, Relay 2 can be used um, if you're not connecting with a gateway or anything like that. You can use Relay 2 as a dry contact closure um, to tell your building automation system that there is a fault, like say an open or shorted sensor for whatever reason, if something got chewed on or a wire got cut or something like that. 
Uh, and relay three is how, uh, how this unit will interact with your, uh, with your mechanicals in order to raise the temperature during uh, thermal disinfection function or thermal disinfection cycle. Um, if your building automation system is controlling your domestic hot water set points, you can use that dry contact closure as a, as a starter to basically tell the building automation, you know, when this closes, uh, if this closes, then, then uh, crank up uh, that domestic hot water storage temperature, and then the control takes it over from there by raising up the distribution temperature as well. Um, you can also use it with full mechanical controls there. If you're running an aquastat, for whatever reason, you can run a second aquastat in uh, the tank at a much higher temperature and, uh, and use that to kick on the boilers as well. Now, in the European market, they do use Relay 4 to flush these systems. If, for example, they're running high temp and they need to dump it out really quickly, uh, they can do that, but, uh, but in our market, not very common. Now, during normal operation, again, 140 in the tank, 120 coming out, 110 coming back, because you're going to have a little bit of temperature drop coming back there, pretty straightforward. And how what we're doing here is we're going to basically talk about how normal operation compares with thermal disinfection operation. Uh, again, 120 coming out, 110 coming back on your recirc return. Now, <clears throat> I did want to point out this fact that point of use mixing valves at all your fixtures here. Now, you've got a mixing valve here that is protecting these two labs and a bathtub here. Now this seems like a pretty small piece of pipe here, but this could be 10, 15, 20 feet. Uh, now this is a dead leg and, and that's gonna be an issue. And so with that in mind, instead of using uh, a single uh, 1070 mixing valve for point of use, maybe to use uh, mixing valves that go underneath the sink. Uh, so again, you can bring that recirc as far out as possible uh, to recirc as much of that system as you can. And that brings us to our our little sink mixer here. This is a new product that we brought to market a couple of years ago, a uh, little four port H pattern mixing valve. Uh, again, NSF 372, uh, really low flow capabilities as far as minimum flow requirements. Uh, it comes with a little bracket, which is pretty awesome. So you can mount it right to the wall, uh, go from your stops to the, the three eighths compression and then out to your fixture, which is pretty neat there as well. So definitely consider that again at each fixture and then take that larger mixing valve down to your Roman tubs uh, to protect those guys down there. And then again, that way you can get more of your, more of your distribution on the, uh, on the reaster. From there, once you go into thermal disinfection, you're gonna crank up that uh, storage temperature, you're gonna crank up that distribution temperature, and you're gonna, uh, gonna crank up that uh, research return temperature. Now, how the control here is going to determine a success or failure in thermal disinfection is by the sensor on the research return. Um, so if, if you tell it what to do here, now, if, if you're running 160 degrees out, you're not gonna get 160 degrees back because you're gonna get temperature loss throughout your distribution. But what you're gonna tell it that you want to see at least 145 for a duration of 45 minutes or whatever the case may be. And that's how it's going to determine whether or not uh, that thermal disinfection failed or, or was successful. And, and that's a pretty neat little feature there as well. So again, 160 going out, 150 coming back, um, pretty straightforward. Now, the next thing to consider is balancing valves. Um, it's pretty common for manual balancing valves to still be used. Uh, but in this particular case, we've got a thermal balancing valve that I think is really interesting. And I'll kind of breeze through this guy. Instead of, uh, instead of balancing based on a specific flow rate, uh, like for example, our thermal setter here, our thermal balancing valves are gonna balance based on temperature. You're gonna set the thermal setter at a specific temperature. If it is not achieving that temperature, it's gonna modulate open. If it's at or above that temperature, it's gonna to start to modulate closed. Uh, so this is a really easy, easy product to install, to use in the fact that you set it to a temperature and you walk away. Um, it's, it's pretty awesome. It gives you a little bit of wiggle room if you're working in those retrofit applications. You don't know how much insulation is on the pipe behind the walls. You don't have your x-ray vision goggles, that kind of stuff. Um, it, it works really well for that. And we've got a few different models because you might be thinking to yourself, well, what if I set that valve to 110 and I do thermal disinfection? And well, that balancing valve is going to want to clamp down as much as possible. And, and that's where we have a bypass cartridge uh, that's available in two different models, whether it be a thermostatic bypass or an actuator controlled bypass. So that way during thermal disinfection, this first cartridge will start to close down, um, but that second cartridge will open up a bypass to allow that thermal disinfection to complete uh, as quickly as possible. Wide range of sizes, half, three quarter, one, an inch and a quarter. It is NSF, NSF 61 uh, for potable water. Uh, it does have adjustments there as well. The locking knob can be used to prevent uh, tinkering. Uh, and it also can be converted in the field. So if you are using a normal balancing valve and you wanted to add thermal disinfection functions and bypasses, you can do that. 
Uh, the other thing that's really cool, as long as you got isolation on either side, you can open up this valve and gut it, clean it, maintain it without pulling the entire valve from the pipe, which is pretty awesome. Uh, from there, you've got options for a check valve. Uh, you've also got options for a temperature gauge, and we also offer options for insulation jackets too. And then we got kind of a stripped down version for those that aren't gonna be using thermal disinfection at all. We've got just kind of a more of a bare bones thermal setter. That, uh, that offers a little bit higher of a flow rate, but, but this is also an option for you guys as well if you're looking for those thermal balancing valves. All right, so the other thing that I wanna stress here with thermal balancing valves and the modulation capabilities is that they pair perfectly with your variable speed circulators. So as the, the valves modulate open and close, the circulator can ramp up and down and do its thing, and, and it's gonna pair really, really well together. Uh, so, you know, you can save energy on your circulation. Uh, you don't have to worry so much about, well, I designed it around a half GPM, but it really needs 0.6 GPM. Uh, the valve will, will take over that little bit of wiggle room for you and, and hopefully provide less callbacks and, uh, and make the system run a lot more effectively and efficiently. Okay, now getting back to the Legio mix, we talked about sizing. Again, it's really important not to oversize this valve. I've only got one more slide left, just so you guys know. Really important not to oversize these valves, but I also want to stress too that every mixing valve out there on the market has a minimum flow requirement. It doesn't matter what kind of mixing valve it is, it has minimum flow requirements. And if you are not meeting minimum flow requirements, you are not going to get stable outlet temperatures. Okay, now if you're running constant research, which I'm always going to recommend, constant research can make up for that minimum flow requirement. So if you are running, for example, an inch and a quarter mixing valve, you need a minimum flow rate of 4.4 gallons per minute. Obviously, you're not going to get that out of a powder room fixture or a small lab. Uh, you're going to need to have your research involved there as well. So, so definitely do that and consider that. Um, as far as orientation in the field, we just want to make sure the actuator is not on the bottom. Keep it you know, somewhere between the 9 o'clock and the 3 o'clock position on the clock. Um, so that way, if, if it does get wet, it doesn't uh, ruin the actuator. And then from there, if you are doing thermal disinfection, uh, think about your materials. You know, you start running up higher temperatures. You think of like your PEXs and things like that. As the temperature increases, your uh, inversely proportional pressure rating is going to go down. Uh, and you got to think about that, especially in some of these larger commercial buildings where, where you need the pressure to get, uh, to get up a little bit higher. And also think about protecting the occupants of that building. You know, obviously, uh, if you are doing thermal disinfection, it doesn't matter if you're doing 130, 140, 150, whatever, you need to make sure to protect those guys so that way, uh, that way nobody's going to be scalding themselves. So, so definitely consider all that stuff. And, you know, at Kalefi, we've got a lot of really cool products from beginning to end uh, that I think you guys would appreciate. Again, from our point of use or our point of distribution mixing valves, like our Legio mix, we do also offer thermostatic uh, mixing valves, three-way mixing valves, all the way to our balancing valves and our point of use mixing valves as well. So, um, so I think that just about covers it. And I, you know, I, we kind of sped up there a little bit at the end because we, we were trying to cram in a little bit more, but I hope you guys, uh, hope you guys appreciated that. I, again, I really appreciate your time. And if there are any questions, uh, I don't, I didn't see any there here. I don't know if you saw any. Yeah, questions there. there, there's one left. It's a pretty good one. Uh, so it's kind of waiting to the end just so we could sort of, uh, we could, we could chew it over and, and see what we could come up with. Um, but one thing I wanted to touch on, you mentioned there briefly at the end, uh, and I, I can't emphasize it enough. One of the, the most special and best benefits to using Kalefi in your projects is that um, basically all of the pieces are field repairable. Um, you can get into a lot of these, these pieces, whether it's an air separator, dirt separator, or this Legionella uh, mixing valve control. Um, the parts are interchangeable, they're replaceable. Uh, if there is an issue, you can take it apart, clean it, put it back together. And sometimes what this means is it, you can avoid having to shut a complete system down to cut out a piece just to reinstall a piece. So not only are you saving labor hours, but you could potentially be saving a, you know, a building from having maybe no hot water for a day or hours or however long it takes. So that, that, that I find is a really good benefit to using the product. Um, another nice thing with the Legionella mixing valve is the stainless steel ball valve inside goes through a self-cleaning process. Uh, now you may have mentioned this already, Cody, but if you did, yeah, okay. Oh, yeah, and but that's, it's worth bringing up again. Trust me. I that that awesome. I think, yeah, that I think in itself is uh, is an awesome feature. Um, depending on where you're where you're installing the valve, what the water quality is like. Um, with that self-cleaning feature, you know, we can ensure that it's never going to get jammed up, prevent flow, or maybe stop working in the middle of, of uh, maybe a disinfection call. Um, so that, that's really important. 
Um, so yeah, so just to touch back to this question here, Cody. Uh, so Pappy asked if an existing domestic hot water system with no storage tanks using only plate heat exchangers with a boiler system or potentially on-demand heater or maybe a steam tube heat exchanger uh, with domestic hot water research and pump, do you have master mixing schemat for this type of application or do we need to add storage tanks? So I think you'd want to be looking at uh, what your required flow rates to the fixtures would be through that system uh, before we really determine a final answer. Yeah, I know the heat sure. exchangers can cause, you know, some, uh, some pressure loss, right? So that, that might be something we want to look at. Yeah, for sure. And especially when you're talking existing systems, um, you know, like there was even that, that hotel that I talked about in the very beginning where they had a four inch Holby mixing valve. Um, you know, I can absolutely guarantee you that that building no longer needed that, that much flow to that building because, you know, again, updated fixtures, lower flow shower heads, uh, lower flow fixtures, things like that. Um, there's probably not a lot of need for it, but, but yeah, like, like you mentioned, Pierre, whether it be, uh, uh, pressure loss across the heat exchanger, that's going to cause issues. Um, whether it, maybe the heat exchanger is not quite big enough and storage is going to be a, a good thing to get you through those peak points, uh, in your demand for the domestic hot water. Um, we don't have any specific schematics for, um, like, uh, you can kind of see one on the screen here, but we don't have anything specific for plate heat exchangers or shell and tube heat exchangers, uh, things like that. Uh, but really, I mean, a source is a source and, and um, I, I'm not really terribly worried about it. It's just a matter of whether or not that source is going to be able to keep up and, and the pressure drop across it. It's not too great. Um, you know, and obviously if, if your pressure drops too great, going through a storage tank with less pressure drop might be ideal too. So so yeah, great question. Um, you know, I, I do draw up a lot of these uh, types of diagrams pretty regularly, uh, depending on the applications and things like that. So if it's something that you'd want to talk about, happy, definitely let us know. So. Yeah, great, great answer, Cody. I think, uh, I think the main point is we welcome all projects. Um, send them our way. We love a challenge, uh, you know, between the team at Kalefi and our team here with Equipco. Um, we'd be happy to work with you and find a solution to your project. Uh, I think the easy answer here to happy is I, I personally, I just love to see storage tanks. If you have the room for them, uh, you know, there's nothing better than having that supply available. Um, especially in the case of redundancy, if, if it's ever needed, if the system's down, we have storage backup for a little bit to get us through. I'm a, I'm a big fan of it, uh, but I know yeah. we're losing floor space every day in our mechanical room. So I, I get that it gets to be a little, a little challenging, but, um, but yeah, feel free to send us your projects and we'd be happy to work with you on them. Yeah, even just for regular maintenance on the boiler to have storage there so you can just do your maintenance, you know, not interrupting service to the building, I, I think is awesome. But like you said, the mechanical rooms keep getting smaller. And, and you know, I even talk about that in regards to other solutions to Legionella control and Legionella management is, is the fact that like these, these systems take up a lot of room and, and they're already getting smaller and smaller. So it's just a matter of time before they're hanging stuff from the ceiling as much as they can you know so so definitely consider that too right yeah thanks for the question happy um so just as a good recap uh you know if you if you need any external source of information Kalefi's full of it uh you can check out coffee with Kalefi, the youtube channels where they've basically uh they dive deeper into each product segment and the applications in which you'll see them uh, Idronics is another amazing resource. Uh, they will break down the application, provide really detailed drawings like this and why we do what we do with the applications we, we see in the field and the, and the devices we have for them. All of that is free, free resources for you to, to, um, to attain. And uh, if you need anything, uh, we're always here to help. Uh, feel free to reach out. You can catch us on our website at, uh, uh, at, uh, at equipgo.com. Um, we've also got uh, social media feeds as well through uh, Instagram, LinkedIn, um, and a few other platforms that you can catch some information there as well. Um, if you need anything or if you ever want any specific trainings as well, uh, we will do this as well just for you and your team and we can focus on a specific topic or specific application if needed. Uh, so feel free to reach out and thank you again for your time today. Thanks, Pierre. Thanks, Equipco. And thanks for everybody's time and have a great day.